A funny thing happened in the second ODI between Ireland and South Africa a little while back. And I don't mean the fact that Ireland won, that seemed about right. Keshev Maharaj smacked the ball out to deep the wicket and Kagisa Rabada was run out. So far, that seems fairly normal. But it wasn't. The ball Maharaj faced was a waist-high full toss. Hit that ball out to Curtis Camphor at deep mid-wicket, took the catch. At this point, Maharaj and the non-striking Rabada stopped mid-wicket because, you know, a catch was taken. But Camphor was square on and probably had a better view of the height and thought there was a fairly strong chance it was a no ball. So he fired the ball back into the keeper who took the bails off with neither batter at the striker's end. So it wasn't a catch, it was a run out. Oh, if only it was that simple. So once the catch was taken, it was fair for both batters to believe that the ball was dead. However, the umpires did that check their height of delivery thing that they do with the third umpire. And at that point, they decided it was a no ball. And of course, then they checked the run out, which Ireland had appealed for. And the umpires decided that Kikisa Rabada was run out. It's important to note that at this point, it is me, Niall O'Brien, and about three random people on Twitter who care about this wicket. Ireland were probably going to win anyway, Although Rabada's hitting was making them nervous. I asked the South African team about the run out and they did not care. I asked other people watching and they were confused but kind of let it go. And since then I have contacted people at the ICC and the MCC trying to work out what happened. What follows is not a conclusive case for, well, anything. Because this is confusing. And I'm not a law hawk or a plain condition czar. But I can't stop thinking about this bloody stupid ball. So I'm going to take you through all the things that it's made me think about. Obviously, I know a few fairly obscure cricket laws, but there's one I know because of Dean Jones. And like most Victorian cricket fans, we remember everything that happened in his career as cricket was trying to defraud him of his rightful place as king of the game. And I remember all this happening at the time, but also it's in Dean Jones's book, One Day Magic, which my mum got signed for me. Thanks, Dina. I am, in fact, still smiling. This is what happened. It is Dean Jones who comes in to replace Jeff Marsh. Courtney Walsh's first wicket of the match. Oh, and what a good one that was. And it's been called no ball. Dean Jones didn't know about it. And now there's an appeal to run out. And uh, he's been given out by the square leg umpire, umpire Cumberbatch. And uh, that really is a bit unfortunate for Dean Jones. He had a bit of good fortune in the first place, but some quick thinking there by the West Indies fielders. Very quick thinking. You can see what an impact he had on Jones. It's the third chapter in his book. And in the book, he mentioned Law 38.2. It's actually 38.2.2.2 in the MCC laws as they stand today. And it's also in the ICC playing condition. So for Dean Jones, he was clearly not attempting a run. He believed that he had been bowled and was leaving the ground on an angle by walking with his bat under his arm. The universal sign for I have been dismissed. But this was given out. And as Jeffrey Dujon helpfully told Jones in the bar later on, three of the West Indians actually knew that it shouldn't have been. So Dean Jones' misfortune was how I learnt about this law in the playing condition. It was the Dean Jones law, or 38.2.2.2, that I thought of straight away here. But this is not what happened here at all. Jones was dismissed on a no ball. It was called on the pitch. Maharaj was dismissed and a no ball was called way later. I'm not even sure how much later it was finally called. That is a key difference because when Rabada was run out by Ireland, the no ball had not been given. So now let's go back to the law that should have saved Jones. 38.2.2.2 states that a no ball has to have been called. It was not, but also, that the batter was not out of his ground attempting a run. Well, this is interesting because Maharaj and Rabada were, at least originally, out of their ground attempting a run. I think it's pretty clear that they stopped running because they saw a wicket happen, but that is why they were out of their crease, attempting a run. Maharaj didn't leave his crease because he was dismissed like Joan. But wait, because I think there's something even more interesting in this. Remember, it was Rabada who was out here, and he was the non-striker. So that law does not apply here. So there is absolutely nothing in 38.2.2.2 that can save Rabada here. When I originally tweeted about this, others pointed to law 31.7, which is about a batter leaving the wicket because they think they are out and the umpire being able to bring them back. But it's quite crucial that the ball was not called dead by the umpires here and neither Rabada or Maharaj actually left the wicket. In fact, they stood right in the middle of it. But now I just want to get to that no ball 
because its late call causes some problems here. Law 41.7.1 covers waist high no balls. And at first I thought, well, this is pretty simple. But then I realized two things. The first is that I have absolutely no idea what a waist is. Like I know what an elbow is. I just broke one of my elbows. And I know what the Adam's apple is. But a waist is not as straightforward as you'd like to think, or if you've ever thought about it at all. Take this from Wikipedia. This suggests that the waist isn't a line, but a large band that ends up near your rib cage. That's not easy to work out, but it gets more confusing as Wikipedia explains. But also different body shapes have different kinds of waists. And when we think about how commentators talk about waist high note balls, and probably us at home watching cricket, we almost always talk about the trouser line. Well, apparently that's not the waistline or even close. I feel like this is the kind of mistake that if more women worked in cricket, we wouldn't have. I mean, at best, this is an unclear and not really a good metric for no balls. So this law is pretty shambolic, but it does get worse because what I'm showing you here is not the law, but the ICC playing condition. And you can see that it states, if the bowler bowls such a delivery, the umpire shall immediately call and signal a no ball. Let's imagine that happens and Maharaj and Rabada hear the call. They would have both been in their crease. They either would have completed the single or gone back to where they wanted to go back. The non-call of this no ball is part of the weirdness of the decision. But I want to go back and focus on the ball itself. There is a reason it wasn't called straight away. In fact, when I first started talking to people who write the laws, their first question was, was it an obvious above waist high no ball call? And it's not. This does seem high. And it's obvious, I suppose, if you take the waistline as the trouser line, as most do, but that's not right. But also, Maharaj is not standing up straight. My guess is, if he was standing up straight on the popping crease, this ball would be almost exactly somewhere between the trouser line and below the waistline as I now understand it. Not to mention that the ball still has another meter to travel. So it's obviously going lower. You could certainly suggest that the umpire's got this wrong. But I like the fact that they still called this no ball. It, safety is important in cricket and we should be calling them more. Now that I know where the waist is, well, I don't really know where the waist is, but now I have more of an understanding of where the waist is. I I now think it's way too high a point for the dangerous no ball calls. It's also worth thinking about if you're a modern player just actually wearing your trousers a lot lower. Let's look at something else. If you do know your laws, you'll know in order to get a wicket you need to appeal. And Ireland did not appeal for the catch here. No one says, how's that when a catch is taken at deep mid wicket though? So with that in mind, a dismissal is not official until the appeal is made. But anyone involved with cricket ever will have thought that once a catch was taken here, there was a wicket. And of course, we have a law for that too. 20.1.1.3. The ball will be deemed dead from the instant of the incident causing the dismissal. So once a batter is dismissed, the ball is dead. That makes sense. It stops double plays from happening. And you know, this is how most of us understand cricket. So Maharaj and Rabada were under the fairly normal belief that this was out and that the ball was dead, even if an appeal wasn't made. We will get to that appeal in a moment. But... In researching all this, it's got my mind a wandering a little bit. I actually sent a conundrum to the ICC and MCC. Let's say Kyron Pollard, who is a man who is more than happy to have a little bit of fun when it comes to the laws of cricket, is captaining a match and AB De Villiers is on the opposition. AB's team has lost a bunch of wickets and he's batting with, I don't know, the number nine. This tail ender then tries to hit a six and skies the ball straight up in the air. Both batters leave their crease, but they don't make the other end and the catch is taken by someone at short mid wicket. Then AB stops mid pitch to adjust his pads and the short mid wicket throws the ball to the keeper and AB is run out. I've said this conundrum to quite a few people, even those who know the laws quite well. No one could actually give me a straightforward answer on that. But luckily the MCC's Fraser Stewart, the, the chief god legend of the MCC laws, explained to me why what I had said could not happen. And it comes back to what happened with Rabada as well. So in my AB gambit, you still have to make an appeal for the run out of AB de Villiers. But once you make an appeal, you're not actually appealing for one kind of dismissal, you're actually appealing for all the different kinds of dismissals. So even though you have specifically appealed for AB de Villiers to be run out, you're actually also appealing for the number nine to be out court. So AB de Villiers cannot be run out at that point, and the number nine would still be sent on his way. Think about that for Rabada. Maharaj hits the ball out to deep with wicket. Ireland do not appeal. Ireland then throw the ball back in and run out Rabada. They then do appeal. When that goes up to the third umpires, Maharaj should have been given out, which made it a dead ball. 
Now, then the umpires would have checked if that was a waist high full toss because it was obviously always fairly close and they would have then decided that Maharaj was not out due to the no ball. But once he was out and that ball was then referred for the no ball, it was a dead ball, which means you cannot get run out of a dead ball. And the reason Fraser exists is because the laws do need to be updated a lot. And the laws can be confusing. So when Brendan Taylor hit the stumps on that ODI a few weeks back, he plays a shot, he then swings his bat, and the bat hits the stumps, and he's given out hit wicket. There are people who know the laws quite well who've told me he should definitely be out for that, as that movement was part of him receiving the delivery. There are others who have told me that it's not out because it was clearly not part of the shot, and he had completed his action in receiving the delivery. I think this is probably not out, but writing laws for cricket is tough. Like I used to believe that law 38.2.2.2 was great, but right now I wonder why the non-striker isn't protected. What if Dean Jones was bold? Alan Border didn't hear the call, and the West Indies had run him out because he was watching Jones leave the field. I generally believe you shouldn't leave your crease unless you're attempting a run. And I think that Rabada and Maharaj probably made a mistake because there was always at least a chance of that being an O-ball. But there is absolutely no doubt that something went very wrong here. It's possible that in one ball, the bowler made an error, the batters made an error, the umpires made an error, and the ICC made an error. About the only people who come out of this well are the island fielders who saw an opportunity. Even if they were wrong, they were right to try it. The real twist here is probably the non-call of no balls on the field, because I'm not sure the playing conditions have quite caught up with the fact that no balls are not called live. Not the ICC, who sent me this as their response. And not even South Africa, who had a chance of winning that game until that decision. Like I said, it's me and Niall O'Brien out here still holding our pitchforks. And I'm not even that upset at this wrong dismissal. Wrong dismissals are made by umpires all the time. And the laws are long and hard to remember. And those delayed no balls cause new problems. But it's weird the ICC just haven't spoken about this. And it has happened again since that game. It happened in the 100, where the umpires got it completely right and decided that the batting team couldn't steal two runs because once the catch was taken, that ball was dead. That zombie ball was killed. Ours was not. In our game, a ball was delivered, swatted, caught, thrown, run out, called, and finally a batter was dismissed erroneously. It was a small error by the umpires that allowed Rabada to be run out by a ball that was dead. And what a magnificent sport this is, where a ball can go from dead to alive. And before your drunk uncle can say it, let me add this. I did check the scorecard, and it is still out.